right, I see we got a few folks on here. So uh, we got some good cases today. And um, these are all, they're not really too terribly difficult, uh, but they're all kind of cases that are pretty classic sort of stuff that you could very easily get on a board examination. So probably asking you some, uh, you know, differential diagnosis questions and things like that when they're pretty straightforward like this. Um, or if, they're, or if, the, if the pattern is that of a differential diagnosis, they probably expect you to kind of uh, either see some subtle differences that might help between one versus another, or just kind of say which of these would not fit in the differential diagnosis of this pattern or something like that. So uh, who wants to give this one a go? Hi, good morning, Dr. Cockrell. This is Annie. I'll take the first one. Okay. Um, so it looks like we have this punch and just from this lower power, I'm seeing a lot of like inflammation and then my eye goes to like the sub epidermal blister that we see at the top. Um, we also have a little bit of looks like re but overall with inflammation and in the blister, I would categorize this as the sub epidermal vesicular dermatitis inflammation category. Taking a closer look, it looks like most of the inflammatory cells are predominantly neutrophils. See some red blood cells to maybe a few EOs mixed in. Good, excellent. Um, so when thinking about my differential, if it's predominantly um, neutrophils and subepidermal blisters, I would think about um, diseases like bullous lupus or like DH or like linear um, IgA bullous dermatosis. Good, excellent. And that's exactly what you should think about. So, um, and if you see something like this, they probably would either show you a picture of an immunofluorescence pattern uh, that would kind of help you to distinguish among those three, or they would, um, you know, give you some other information because generally those are going to look fairly similar. Now, if you're if it were going to be lupus erythematosus, um, usually you'll see some other features of lupus to the side of it, uh, and you really don't have any vacuolar alteration here. If you look at this area over here, th this lesion uh, where the blister is, is formed is, is probably a pretty late super inflamed blister. So one clue that you can do is look kind of to the side and see if there are any other changes there that can kind of help you. And you see this little area here? We've got this nice little small collection of neutrophils just at the tips of that dermal papilla. Mm -hmm. That you see in an early, super early, you know, lesion of dermatitis repetiformis. So this is probably an area to the side of the blister that's probably also been affected by the process, but it's just not as obvious. So that's a clue that you can use if you sort of want to sort of bet that it's going to be one disease versus the other. Um, and in this case, it, it happened to be dermatitis repetiformis. But you're right, if you see something like this, they're not going to expect you to be able to tell those, those three from each other. Now, uh, there are a couple of other diseases that can give you a subepidermal blister with neutrophils. This is probably less likely to be on your board examination, but at least we can talk about it. Um, so do you know of any other conditions where you can sometimes see a subepidermal vesicle like this with relatively abundant neutrophils, other than those three that you mentioned. So um, you've been the already got the question correct. So you've already got <laughs> an A. So now you're trying to get an A plus. <laughs> in terms of neutrophils, I'm not sure. What do you see it in like the epidermal lysis bullosa? Good, excellent. There's one form of epidermal lysis bullosa. Uh, if you see EBA, for example, you can see the cell poor type with scarring and just basically looks very cell poor, almost looks kind of like a, uh, maybe like PCT in a way. Um, there is a type that you can get abundant neutrophils as well. And then there's also a form that can look like um, bullous pemphigoid. We're going to have uh, eosinophils and, and lymphocytes. So uh, yes, EBA can sometimes give you neutrophils. Um, there are a couple of other cases. One that if you really, if you know it, I'll be super surprised. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if I know it. <laughs> All right. 
Well, there's one finding here, and this, this is kind of an old blister that's kind of gradually gotten necrotic, but um, if you see PCT, you'll usually see the little caterpillar bodies in here. This really is not that. This is just kind of a, a, an old roof of a blister that's just totally necrosed. Uh, but you can see uh, PCT, interestingly enough, sometimes you can get a, a neutrophilic infiltrate in that also. That's not very well known, but if you do an immunofluorescence biopsy of PCT, you'll often see IgG, C3, A, M around the blood vessels and at the junction. And so sometimes that's not just there for, you know, grins. It actually sometimes actually is chemotactic for inflammatory cells. And uh, a lot of uh, people don't realize that sometimes you can see PCT with abundant neutrophils. So that's something you might see, you know, clinically on occasion. I don't think the board's going to you know, ask you uh, about that. And another situation where you can sometimes see a uh, subdermal blister with neutrophils that are in abundance is pustular leukocytoclastic vasculitis. You can, get, you can get a bullous vasculitis, and the one that's the most common is actually IgA-mediated vasculitis. And so, you, so if you you should think about that also, um, just when you're kind of doing your differential diagnosis of subdermal blisters with with neutrophils, this does not have any vasculitis, so that was not the diagnosis here. And this actually was confirmed with, with immunofluorescence. Now, the only other thing that they're, they're likely to ask you about these subabnormal blisters with neutrophils, so let's say they showed you this and they said, well, you know, these people are smart, they're taking the exam, they're going to get that pretty quickly. Um, they may start asking you questions about um, drugs that would cause linear IJ bolstermatosis, for example. They might ask you like what the HLA haplotypes are that are associated with dermatitis herpetiformis, or, you know, what are some of the types of um, immunofluorescence patterns you might see with this. So just make sure you're aware of all those various things too, because um, this is pretty straightforward when you see a subabnormal blister with neutrophils, the differential diagnosis is limited. So they're going to have to think of something else to, to sort of test you on that. So that's great. It's good that you were able to pick that up. Okay, I got this one. Um, hard to tell what sort of biopsy it is, maybe nucleation, excision, or a punch. Um, from this view, we see some sort of glandular tissue, maybe thinking salivary gland or sebo, kind of almost like looks like sebocyte from the high power. Close up, it definitely looks like salivary gland tissue. Good, excellent. Why, why did you say salivary gland? You know that it is that, and that's correct, but why, if someone said, well, you know, prove yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> there are a you... couple of things. So I don't see the epidermis right now, but when looking at it prior, it didn't have a granular tissue. It didn't have a corneal, um, sorry, granul granular or corneal layer. And the epidermis was almost foamy. Um, kind of thinking, kind of pointing me towards mucosa. And then I saw some muscle, some skeletal muscle. And then looking at the actual gland, like the, the salivary gland tissue, um, comparing it to like sebocytes, it just didn't have like that nucleus that kind of, that you would be able to see. Yeah, good. So notice these nuclei here are at the periphery of mm -hmm. these cells. And this material that is inside the cells, you know what that is, right? Mucin. Yeah, and this is what we call sialomucin. Uh, so it's like a mucin that gets secreted by these glandular cells, as opposed to hyaluronic acid mucin, which is uh, made by fibroblast and, and mast cells actually contribute to that. So this is glandular mucin, and it's got a, a lower pH, as I recall, so a bit more acidic than, than the other hyaluronic acid mucin. But you can see these cells are basically just filled with that. So that, these are the same kind of cells that you see like in your salivary gland, mucus glands in your uh, nasal cavity, in your tracheobronchial tree, uh, same kind of glands you see in your GI tract. So it's these are all sort of analogous glands. And then also you've got ducts here. So and these are little ducts that are lined by these cuboidal cells here. And actually some of these little cells at the very periphery that are kind of eosinophilic are probably myoepithelial cells. So they're actually cells that kind of help to contract both the glands and sometimes the little ductal structures as well. So yes, this is salivary gland tissue and it's got some inflammation in here in the background. Mm -hmm. And then we've got this area over here. Yes. So we see the cystic space. Um, that's not like a true cystic space because it doesn't have the epithelial lining. However, 
you can see that it has a little bit of stringy mucin around the edges. You can also see that it has some inflammation around that space with histiocytes, some lymphs, um, and some fibroblasts. Yeah, so what's the diagnosis? So I think this may be a mucosal because this looks like granulation tissue. Um, yeah, that's exactly what it is. A lot of a lot of this mucin here is. So what happens in a mucosal basically is is the glands, you know, they get plugged up or some kind of traumatic insult happens. Somebody bites their lip or they get hit in the mouth or something like that, and then those little uh, ducks probably get severed or something, and when they grow back, they get plugged up, and then you get a rupture of these. Uh, these these things are secreting their mucin, and it just kind of basically gets secreted into the into the uh, stroma, and it, it doesn't it doesn't go all the way to the surface and get into the oral cavity or the nasal cavity or wherever it is, and just basically leads to this kind of reaction. So this is mucin. It's got some exactly what you said, inflammatory cells, and whatnot, and that's often what we see. Occasionally, we'll actually see what looks like an an ectatic um, duct that's filled with mucin, that's less common. Usually we'll just see this thing that kind of looks like a, a ruptured structure like this. So this is a mucus seal. So that's exactly right. Now, um, if they're going to put something on the exam, this probably isn't going to appear on the exam, I, I wouldn't think. But if they were, uh, they might sort of try to trick you and, and say, you know, could this be Sjogren syndrome, for example? Um, and the answer to that would really be no. I mean, you don't really get this kind of inflammation over here with Sjogren's, and, and there you're kind of looking for lymphocytes that are sort of inside the glandular epithelium, mm -hmm. gradually kind of uh, causing it to be atrophic. And then, of course, as you know, in Sjogren's syndrome, they get a dry mouth, xerostomy, and that sort of thing. So you have a fewer number of the uh, salivary glands here. You've got a ton of them. So this really wouldn't fit very well with Sjogren's syndrome. Um, they might put something in here like uh, a mixed tumor of the skin. Now, would you possibly choose that as a, as a diagnostic uh, selection here? Um, mixed tumor of the skin. Well, because of the epidermis, I think we were thinking it was more mucosal. So I don't know if I would. Well, you can get the mixed tumor of, of the, in the, um, salary gland also you can get that but it's basically remember the chondroid syringoma thing we talked about i think in the last conference where you get the abundant mucin that's present not within individual glands but it's more that's more hyaluronic acid mucin that ultimately can turn into cartilage it undergoes cartilaginous metaplasia with not these sort of uh, salivary duct type structures here you get more cells that really look kind of more like eccrine ducts in that condition so i doubt if they would put that on the exam it's it's possible mm -hmm. but i i think i doubt you're going to see this but this is really I just wanted you to kind of get a sense for what these things look like when you see them uh, under the microscope because you'll see these clinically all the time so that's good anybody uh questions or comments about this one okay great all right, let's see. We'll this. I'll take this one. Okay. So it looks like we have a punch um, just based on the amount of hair follicles and sebaceous glands we can see. I would guess we we're either on the face or maybe the axilla. Okay, good. Good idea. Let's see if there's anything, other clues that might help us there. What about this? Is that cartilage? No. See these little sort of... Oh, they're the mucinous glands? Well, there's a se there's secretion in it, but look at the very tips of these cells here. Oh, they're apocrine glands. Yes, good. <laughs> you said, you said uh, maybe the axilla, so here you go. You've got uh, the apocrine glands, which would favor the axilla or, you know, some... Uh, certain parts of the body, the groin area, you get, it, you get the uh, apocrine glands there in certain areas. So, but this would be very likely to be the axilla. We've got these uh, sebaceous glands here. We've got some fairly deep seated follicles here. So, yeah, that's a good idea. And probably not the face. You usually don't get apocrine glands on, on the face. Okay, good. So, what's the pattern here? What are we seeing? Looks like a um, 
deep dermatitis. Good. A lot of pustule formation as we get into the sub-Q fat and the deep dermis. So you say pustule formation. Um, yeah, down in the sub-Q, I thought I saw really discreet collections. Yeah, I mean, well, what do we call this when we just see this really fairly diffuse infiltrate of, and, and what kind of cells are these again? Those look like lymphocytes. Well, some of them are. But the what, plasma cells, there's some histiocytes in there too. What are the main cell? What are all these here that we're looking at? Oh, there's a lot of neutrophils. Yeah, and, yeah. It's So it's mostly neutrophils. So you said mm -hmm. pustules, so basically really right. kind of two types of pustules, right? There's neutrophilic pustules and then kind of eosinophilic pustules. You know, you get the eosinophilic pustule folliculitis. But here we get mostly neutrophils. And we get this sort of fairly diffuse nodular and diffuse pattern. So it's mm -hmm. not just, you know, sort of when you think of pustules, think of it within a follicle, or they can get it within, you know, adnexal structures too. And there actually are some of those, I agree with you. But it looks like there's some more nodular component, almost like if there were, if these things were confined to the, say, apocrine glands or the hair follicles, it's ruptured. And that's kind of getting more of a diffuse pattern. Well, so, the other predominant well, cell that I saw a lot of were eosinophils. Um, you know, there are some eos in here. A lot of red cells, too, though, that are kind of almost simulating eosinophils. But there are some eosinophils. I'll, I'll, I'll go along with that, too. But the majority of the cells is, is neutrophil predominant. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what do you think about when you think of a separative, diffuse, nodular and diffuse separative dermatitis What's your differential diagnosis of that pattern? I think about a lot of acneiform type things like HS or folliculitis. Okay, HS, which is hidradenitis suppurativa. Okay, mm -hmm. that's that's good to think of. What else? You said folliculitis. Now, tell me a little bit more about folliculitis here, what you think about there. Well, there's just a lot of inflammation surrounding. The, I saw some the hair follicles around, and I thought I saw a lot of eos in the pustules that are in the deep dermis. So I thought about an eosinophilic folliculitis. Okay. And then Does if that you usually see... give you this very dense infiltrate, and and actually, if you look inside here, there's actually some some suppuration within these apocrine glands here, in the lumen here of these apocrine glands. Do you usually see that in eosinophilic folliculitis? No. No, you really don't. Where do you see that most commonly? Is it Fox Fortis disease? Well, that's kind of apocrine miliaria, and you can get some secondary inflammation there. But what about these very deep apocrine structures here that are just filled with polys that ruptured? You've got some granulomatous inflammation over here. And then you've got this really dense diffuse infiltrate surrounding those areas. And then you've also perhaps even got some involvement here, this follicle here, this other probably hair follicle up here. What disease will give you this? You've already said it. Hydradenitis suppurativa. Yeah, this is really pretty classic for hydradenitis suppurativa. And probably not really so classic for just garden variety folliculitis, right? You don't usually see this kind of inflammation involving the apocrine uh, glands in just typical folliculitis. That, that's fairly unusual. And look how deep it is. So you can imagine what this thing looked like. It's probably a boggy, deeply seated inflammatory infiltrate. So if you're thinking of HS, there is a type of folliculitis that's in that sort of tetrad that we talk about. Mm -hmm. So what's what are the other entities that kind of are included in the in the classic? tetrad of hydradenitis suppurativa. The follicular occlusion tri... Uh, yeah, or, or some people call it a tetrad. They add a uh, fourth entity in there. You could think of dissecting cellulitis of the scalp. Good. And the other name for that is folliculitis decalvans. So that's the other thing, or folliculitis uh, absetans at Sophodians is a long name on there. I, I, I used to use that a lot when I was a resident, but I don't use it too much anymore. Liclatus capitis, pericapitis, sedans at Sophodians, that's the other name. I think Dr. Rosen likes to use that name a lot. So that's the other one. And now those are all kind of related, and that's kind of on the scalp. So it's similar to this. What else kind of fits into that 
tetrad or triad, if you will. Acne conglobata. Acne conglobata is another one. And then a lot of people will toss in pyderma gangrenosum into that category. And then some people even throw in pyelonidal cyst, pyelonidal sinus. I think today there's probably a more of a, of a bigger spectrum to possibly even include things like, you know, SAFO and some of these uh, very prominent neutrophilic inflammatory conditions associated with arthritis and fever. And those sometimes can kind of fall into this category as well. So it's probably more than just you know, a, a triad, it's really often, there's probably like a whole spectrum of diseases. Some of them maybe tend to involve the apocrine glands and follicles more. Some just involve only the follicles. Some maybe even pyromagagranosum, if you buy for those lesions really early, they involve the follicles and they quickly rupture and leave you the cribriform ulcers. So they're all kind of related in a way. And they just kind of, it's sort of which sort of part of the follicle or the apocrine gland or whatever is targeted, which part of the body is targeted. So they're all sort of related, if you will. So it's kind of important to just get this pattern down. And, and you're correct. This is this would be, this was hidradenitis superiorativa in this case. It's a great example because it's really, I'd say, fairly uncommon for us to get a biopsy where we see this. I mean, this is really beautiful where we actually see the suppuration inside the apocrine glands. That's that's really relatively uncommon. So that's that's what really I like this case because of that. There's new drugs for this now, too, now, you know, they're really promoting treatment for this. So um, they like to ask questions when there's new medications. So they might show you that and then ask you what, what kind of treatments might be available for it. Okay, so let me get this straight here. I can take this one. This is Jessica. Okay. All right. So we have a shave. Okay. It looks inflammatory. Good. Um, and then we have this really compact hyperkeratosis with parakeratosis. Do you think the clinician thought this was an inflammatory skin disease? Um, They're either kind of a very mean clinician sending us a shave biopsy of something like this to try to trick us or something, or they, they might have been fooled, you know, thinking it was... Yeah something else. What do you think they might have thought this was, just looking at this low power image here? Um, maybe like a malignancy, like a squamous cell or something? Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. They, they probably thought this was a cancer. In fact, in fact, I remember this case and, I, and they did think this was a cancer. They thought it was squamous cell. So they took a shave biopsy, and you can imagine why they might think that. It's, it's reasonable. It's got this marked verrucous epithelial hyperplasia. It's got this crust on the surface, but it didn't fool you, right? You right. thought it was inflammatory. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so we don't, we're compromised, right? We, we, we can't assess very much of the dermis. We can't talk about the pattern here. Mm -hmm. uh, we can sort of maybe see a little bit of it. So if we're really being a Sherlock's home, homes like dermatopathologists, we can sort of say what we what pattern this probably is. So what pattern did you think it was when you started looking at it? Um, so we, yeah, so, so you're right. We can only see a little bit of the dermis, but it's pretty much all filled with inflammatory cells. So I thought it maybe could have been diffuse. Yeah, yeah maybe. We, we just don't know. But what kind of inflammatory cells did you see? So there are some clues when you, when you start looking at a little higher magnification. Yeah, so I saw a lot of histiocytes, neutrophils. Good. I saw yeah, good, good, excellent. So neutrophils, uh, some histiocytes. So what what pattern is that when you see when you see neutrophils plus histiocytes? What do we call that? Um, like separative. Good, separative granulomatous. And so what do we think of when we think of separative granulomatous inflammation? What what does that trigger when we start looking at that? We start um, thinking of diseases that can cause that. So we start thinking of like infectious. Good, good. You start thinking of infectious. You should start thinking that right away. And especially when you've got this marked pseudocarcinoma to hyperplasia, you start saying, oh, okay, well, they thought it was cancer, but no, no, it's not. It's got separate granulomatous inflammation, so it might be an infectious disease. What kind of infectious diseases tend to give you this pattern? Um, so either like 
fungal or like atypical mycobacterial? Yeah, exactly. So you start thinking of deep fungal infections, um, atypical mycobacterial infections sometimes. You know, in my experience, those don't give you as much epithelial hyperplasia. They can, you know, like tuberculosis, varicose acutis, that can give you marked epidermal hyperplasia. But if you'll see most patients that have like uh, atypical mycobacterial infections, um, like M. kansasii or M. avium intracellulari in an AIDS patient, they don't usually give you quite as much epidermal hyperplasia as you see here. They can. Uh, M. avium usually doesn't, but, but M. marinum can. But it's more common with these conditions, with the, with the uh, deep fungal infections. So more common with that than atypical mycobacterial infections. Mm -hmm. uh, less common with pyogenic infections. Uh, sometimes you can, you know, botryomycosis occasionally, uh, actinomycosis, but less common. So when you think of this, you should probably think of deep fungal more likely. Okay. So if you're going to tell me where to start looking, if we're looking for bugs, mm -hmm. where do you want me to look here? I would start looking within like the micro abscesses that we Good. see. Yeah, so let's look inside some of those. And did you see anything when you started looking in the micro abscesses? Yeah, I saw these like brown colored spores. Good. Excellent. So it works. <laughs> we looked in the abscess and guess what? We see the organisms in there. And they are little brown structures. What what do you call these? organisms here? There's a couple of names for it. Some people refer to them as like copper penny spores, but then they're also called medlar bodies or sclerotic bodies. Yeah, good. Excellent. So what's the diagnosis here? Chromoblastomycosis. Good. Excellent. So here we go. You can see it. It's a beautiful example of that. Um, you know, if you're going to get this on the board examination, they probably aren't going to give you a shave biopsy like this. They'll probably give you like an incision biopsy or something like that where there's a good deeper specimen, but um, we were able to make the diagnosis here based on a shave biopsy because they, they thought it was cancer and it turned out not to be. Now, you have to be careful because I've seen these cases sometimes be called cancer. Um, and then they go back into a re-excision of it and they sometimes mutilate the patient unnecessarily and it can lead to disastrous consequences. So, um, if you ever see this pattern with subjective granulomas inflammation, you want to look carefully like in these little abscesses and in that, the uh, if you see histiocytes or multinucleated, look inside those, make sure you don't miss the organisms because you, you don't want to call this a cancer. And sometimes keratoacanthoma can look very much like this, uh, especially if you can get abscesses in keratoacanthoma. And, you know, now, uh, basically, keratoacanthoma, it doesn't exist anymore as a benign diagnosis. They're all called squamous cell carcinoma, keratoacanthoma type, because they, you know, the insurers have decided that keratoacanthoma is a benign entity and doesn't even need to be treated. So uh, they all get called cancer so we can treat them and get paid for it. So uh, basically, you have to make sure that you're not missing um, this when you get a biopsy that just shows mostly verrucous epithelial hyperplasia like this. What are a couple of organisms that uh, tend to cause chromoblastomycosis? Um, so you have like, there's like the Cladosporium carioni that can, the Phyllophora, um, Fonsecchia, and then Rhino, I think there's Rhino Cladiella. Yeah, good. That's, and I think you just, they're probably not going to ask you a lot of questions about that, <clears throat> but they might ask a couple, so you may as well get them right, because they're fairly easy to remember. Um, I wouldn't um, spend hours and hours learning all the esoteric stuff about mycology, but if you learn some of the main overall points of it, like those, those general entities that you just mentioned right there, uh, you'll get those questions correct. And uh, they might ask something about grains. So if, if, if you do a culture of these, um, or, or in some cases, you might even see like in a Madura mycosis, you'll see blackish grains if they're caused by one of these dematiaceous fungal organisms, like you mentioned. So great. That's good. So I'm glad you guys were able to diagnose that and, and saw the organisms. And uh, you can pretty much uh, be guaranteed that you will be, you'll see some bugs on the exam because they're unequivocal, they can't be argued with, and they're kind of fun, and they'll put enough on there where you can recognize them. Well, here's another one that you're likely, you're going to see on the exam. Okay, I'll be taking this case. Good morning. 
great. So it looks like we have a punch um, on a thickened surface, so possibly the acral surface or extremities. Yeah, Definitely. I, agree. I think this is almost <laughs> certainly acral. Um, it yes. doesn't have any real follicles or anything. So yeah, that's that's good. I agree with that. So it appears inflammatory, uh, definitely, um, and especially in the subcutaneous tissue and possibly the deep dermis too. Yeah, I, I think it's, yeah, I agree. I think this looks like some fat, so it's probably in the subcutaneous tissue, but I agree it's probably kind of both. A lot of times we call things subcutaneous nodules and they're really dermal nodules. You know, for example, a dermatofibroma, you, you know, go and feel that. So, well, that feels like a subcutaneous nodule but it's really in the dermis and it kind of feels like it's in the fat but it's it's really not so this lesion is probably dermis and subcutaneous kind of a combination of both i would say so you're right and then looking at patterns it, it looks like a, a palisading granulomatous pattern good excellent palisaded granulomatous dermatitis now what's your approach to that what are the three most common Palisaded granulomas dermatitides. So we have granuloma annulari. Good. Um, we have rheumatoid nodules. Um, and then I was also thinking about necrobiosis acoitica. Yeah, those are the three most common forms. So now there's two different ways to do different diagnosis. One is like that, where you just kind of put three things in the differential and, and you know, kind of toss it up there. But what are some of this, what one type of granulomenulari would be in the difference of diagnosis of this specific lesion we're looking at right now? Uh, would that be the deep, deep GA? Excellent. Yes, the deep or the so-called subcutaneous GA ver version. What are some other types of GA that don't look like this? Um, is they're just like the actinic granuloma. Uh, yeah, I know. And I, I'm like you. I think actinic granuloma is a variant of sun-induced GA or GA that just occurs in sun damaged skin. So that's, I'm in agreement with you. I, I tend to be a lumper. I don't really think that actinic granuloma is really a separate disease. It might be, but I don't, yeah, I've never been convinced of that. But there are about four or five other subtypes of GA too, right? Yes. I know you have like perforating GA. Good. Um, disseminated GA. Good. Yep. Um, patch GA. Yeah. Yeah. What does that look like when you see the patch type GA that when you feel it, it doesn't really have much uh, in duration to it and you vibe to that? What does that usually look like under the microscope? Under the microscope? I know that it can resemble like morphia or like MF. Um, you know, clinically? that's the, yeah, you're right. Exactly. Clinically, those are usually the things that it gets sent in as because clinicians don't think of it. Um, but if you biopsy it, it's got a pretty characteristic histology that it doesn't look like this type of GA, for example. Hmm, I'm not sure about that. It looks more like an, a diffuse interstitial histiocytic okay. trait. It's a so-called interstitial GA, and that usually kind of gives you a macular kind of appearance clinically. So that's good. And then of course, there's the classic palisaded form where you get the rings and everything. That's the, the obvious type. Um, you get this type. And then there's one other type that's really not a histologic variant, but it's a, a type that you should at least think about if you see GA that kind of pops up for no good reason in an older person. Is it systemic GA? Well, perineoplastic GA. And, and you know, that's it's kind of slightly controversial, but um, I think there was an article in JAD just last month that actually talked about, uh, I think about a bit of a letter to the editor where they're talking about GA that pops up in older people and it's associated with underlying malignancy. So um, if you see that happen in a clinic patient, uh, just, you know, just tap the brakes and say, hey, you know, is there any reason why this person be developing GA when they're like 65, 70 years old? You know, just make sure they don't have some kind of underlying uh, neoplasm in that situation because it can sometimes be a harbinger. So that's good. So there's lots of different types of GA. The only type that would look like this would be the so-called subcutaneous or deep uh, form of GA. Do you think, uh, and so you think this is necrobiosis like Poitica? I don't think so. No, um, I wouldn't even put that in the differential of this. So in this specific case, we toss that out. We'd say, well, this would most likely be either um, subcutaneous deep GA or rheumatoid nodule. 
And how are you going to distinguish those two from one another? So we can look closer and looking within this, the granuloma, the central area, there's differences between the two. Yes. There sometimes can be some overlap. I wish it was always the way the textbook said it was, <laughs> but there, it's not always the way the textbook says it uh, should be. So what do you see in rheumatoid nodule in the center of the palisade? So rheumatoid nodule, you'd see more of like the fibrin and necrotic connective tissue. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, we, you really can't sort of get necrotic connective tissue because it's never alive. So we talk about degenerated collagen, but basically you've got this pink material. So that really look when it's pink in the center, that kind of tells you it's probably more likely going to be rheumatoid nodule. Some of this is probably fibrin and degenerated collagen, but you've got this, this bluish gray material. So what's the bluish gray material? I believe it's mucin. Yeah, you believe right. <laughs> so, so, you know, the textbooks say, well, if it's, if it's fibrin and it's some degenerated collagen, well, it's rheumatoid nodule. We can just, you know, make the diagnosis and move on to the next case. But in the real world, it's like this. <laughs> you get some mucin and you get some fibrin and you get some degenerated collagen. And then you correlate it with the clinical information and the patient got, you know, obvious rheumatoid arthritis usually when they have this or it's a child and it's just one nodule on the heel and they don't have any arthritis. So there's overlap between these two histologically. I, I wish there, there wasn't, but there is. And so in this case, it happened to be rheumatoid nodule, but it does show um, that, uh, you know, it shows you the difference. I mean, this, you, you're, you know, you would not put those other forms of GA in the differential and you really wouldn't throw in LD in the differential diagnosis. So it, there's overlap and you'd have to kind of correlate it in this case, this was rheumatoid nodule. I think if the board is going to show you this, we're going to try to find one that's got mostly the pinkish fibrin and they wouldn't show you, you know, one that's kind of a slightly overlap kind of case like this one. Um, notice this also occurred in an adult. Now, how do we know this is an adult here? Um, what am I showing you here? What's this stuff? uh the the glands well look at the oh yeah. solar elastosis yeah the solar elastosis you got to be old to get that you can't be a, a kid so basically <laughs> this is more likely an adult and so that's another clue now just as a bonus question um what are a, a couple of other things that you could throw in the differential diagnosis here there's one i want you to remember um because it's important that you don't want to forget about it. When you see subcutaneous GA or you see um, rheumatoid nodules, you should always just toss it in the differential. You can toss it out, but but you, you should think about it at least when you see this pattern. We don't want to miss um, like an epithelioid sarcoma. Excellent. Good. You've been well-trained. That's what <laughs> you should think about. That's good. You should always keep that in the back of your mind. Um, it's the most common acral soft tissue sarcoma in young individuals. And so it's sort of a tragic situation if you miss it. Um, and that can, is basically what you see there is if you look at the periphery, you'll see atypical cells. They're, they're epithelioid cells that are usually you'll see some mitoses and you'll see the cells are dying. And that's why it sort of gives you that sort of pseudo palisaded granulomous inflammation because it's tumor necrosis. And it can simulate a palisaded granuloma like this. So uh, I've seen cases misdiagnosed as GA before, uh, delayed diagnosis and causes problems. So just keep that in the back of your mind. The only, there's a couple other things that can sometimes look like this. Um, if you inject uh, Zyderm collagen, you can sometimes get a pseudo palisaded granulomas dermatitis because it actually forms a granulomatous inflammation around the acellular collagen that you're injecting in the center of it. So that can simulate this pattern as well on occasion. Um, and then rarely, uh, sometimes we'll see uh, tuberculoid granulomatous inflammation from an infection simulate this kind of pattern too. So just keep those in the mind, in your back of your mind as well. But the, the major, but you're correct, this was in the uh, family of rheumatoid nodule subcutaneous GA, and that's actually what this turned out to be was rheumatoid nodule. Thank you. Okay. A little different animal here. Hi, Dr. Cockrell. It's me, Yelena. I'll be describing this case. Okay. 
So we've got a punch biopsy here and it goes pretty deep down into the fat. At the very top of the epidermis overall, it's pretty normal looking, perhaps just a little bit of mild acanthosis. Below that in the upper dermis, we've got a little bit of proliferation of some thick walled blood vessels, suggestive of some chronic venous insufficiency. And then, right. yes. Excellent. That's, that's very good that you were able to pick that up. Is that helpful in this case? It is. Good. So what's, what's the main thing that catches your eye at low magnification? The main thing going further down is in the fat, we've got a lot of inflammation of the septa, but a little bit in the lobules as well. So kind of like a mixed picture of paniculite. Right, basically, here. you're seeing you're, you're in the category, the non-inflammatory patterns is what? Paniculitis. Paniculitis, good. So low patterns of weight. Okay, we're looking, everything seems pretty much normal up here, but there's abnormality down the fat. So we're looking at paniculitis. And then you've already started sort of describing the paniculitis. So well, it's a septal, largely paniculitis, but it's also significantly lobular. Yes. Good. And then you picked up the fact that it's on the lower leg. The stasis mm -hmm. might change here. Okay, good. So is this, so tell us about this. So it's both kind of septal and lobular. Yes. Uh, what's the next approach? Next thing that you look for? So the next thing you look for is kind of like zooming in on the fat cells. And we see that some of these membranes have kind of been destroyed and are grouping together to form these like larger holes in the subcutaneous fat, as well as these kind of like feathery looking areas, which is called lipomembranous changes. Good, excellent. Membranous fat necrosis, like you see right here, beautiful example of that. These really are not even lipocytes anymore. These are what we call fat microcysts. The lipocytes have kind of ruptured and just like in the lung when you get alveoli that sort of form little blebs, sort of doing the same thing here. So, so what's the diagnosis here? Lipodermatosclerosis. Yeah, this is pretty classic for that. And then the other thing is a lot of people don't realize now it's called uh, dermatosclerosis because you actually get sclerotic collagen in the septa also. Mm-hmm. So what are some things in the differential diagnosis of this pattern? So other things you could think about are erythema nodosum, but that's more largely septal and wouldn't have as much of the lobular inflammation. Another you sometimes thing- sometimes get a little bit of lobular inflammation, usually at the you know, areas around the uh, thickened septa and that, but you're usually going to see that inflammation with granulomatous uh, so-called Miescher's granuloma that you see. So we don't really have any granulomous inflammation here. So I think I agree. This is not that great for erythema nodosum, although this does have a septal paniculitis component. And the most common septal paniculitis that we see is erythema nodosum. So you certainly would think about that at low magnification. You go to higher magnification, you see these other changes that you've described, you'd probably reject that. But just make sure that you realize you can get this thick sclerotic collagen of the septa in this stasis-altered condition. Mm -hmm. What else would you think about when you see thick septa like this with some sclerosis here? Yeah, you could also think of subcutaneous fat necrosis of the newborn, but in that condition, you typically see these like needle-shaped clefts within the fat cells, which I wasn't able to see any. And you can also see some calcification in that one. But yeah, no. yeah. do you like this for subcutaneous fat necrosis of the newborn though? No, no, I don't like that either. I, that's mostly pure lobular. So that that sort of doesn't work. But what else? If you're looking down at your multiple choice and you've got lipodermatous sclerosis, and you feel pretty confident you're going to do that. But what if somebody puts in their nephrogenic systemic fibrosis? Mm -hmm. Could this be that? I mean, you've got this thick collagen here. You've got fibroblasts. You've got maybe some eosinophils in here. Um, Yay or nay? I think no, because in that one, the fibrosis is a lot more widespread. Yeah, and it usually isn't just localized here, although it can be deep. Um, often it'll replace the fat and, and it'll go deep and you can mm -hmm. get the calcifications and the little uh, abnormal elastic fibers that can be slightly brownish in color and the little lollipop structure. So <clears throat> that would not be as good of an answer. And you usually don't see the membranous fat necrosis in that, which you see 
here also. So that wouldn't be a good choice. What about subcutaneous morphia? That's one thing that we could consider possibly like a lipodystrophy um, sort of situation. You're thinking of something like maybe uh, uh, on coup de sabre or something like that, variant of morphia? Possibly. Would that be good for this? Do you like that one with this membranous fat necrosis change? Uh, no, because I think in that one, um, there's like a decrease in the fat. Like the as the lesion progresses, there's an absence of the fat. Gradually chokes it off. And what mm -hmm. else do you not like about this for morphia here? You got I think for morphia, it would be more sclerotic appearing than this. Yeah, you've got a little bit of sclerotic collagen here, but you've got an increase in the number of fibroblasts as opposed mm -hmm. to an increase in the number of fibroblasts. So this is more fibrosis with some sclerotic collagen than really primarily sclerosis. So it is got some sclerosis, you know, like a lipodermatosclerosis. So there is some of that there for sure, but it's also really fibrosis. So it's not purely sclerotic. So just don't fall down the path of that. Um, this is kind of interesting because it also had a couple of these little blood vessels that were sort of clotted off here. The patient may have a little bit of background, um, you know, atrophy blanche or, you know, it's kind of curious that they sort of have these little clotted vessels. So I don't think this patient had any other known disease, but, um, you know, this is a little bit of slightly unusual finding here. I don't know if any guys noticed that. Uh, and you can get you can get lipodermatosclerosis-like change anytime there's ischemia in there. Slow ischemia from some reason or another in this area uh, can lead to this. So uh, you can, you know, stasis is not good. It can cause stasis dermatitis. It can cause stasis-associated lipidovasculitis. It can cause this problem. It can cause cellulitis, lymphedema. So lots of bad things happen uh, when you get bad circulation on your lower legs. So I don't know if those little thrombos vessels might have, you know, been pathologic related to the, the patient's background uh, stasis change. And, uh, you know, we'll often prescribe Plavix and things like that for these patients. They, they do pretty well with it. Okay, great. Very good. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Cockrell. This is Ellie. I'll be taking the next case. Okay. Um, so starting off, um, I was kind of thinking this was a nucleation because I couldn't find any epidermis. Good. Excellent. Um, it's a very dense proliferation of cells um, that look mostly glandular. I didn't see, um, you know, a lot of inflammatory cells, so I was leaning more towards neoplastic. Good. Would you favor um, benign or malignant just looking at this? So hard because I want to favor benign, um, but it's not very well circumscribed. Um, yeah, you know, it's kind of hard when we have something like this. Right. Um, I think you're right. I think they did try to enucleate it, and it probably felt like a little cyst, and so they probably just took a little scalpel and incised the top of it, and they kind of shelled it out. And usually, when things shell out, it's a sign of that they're fairly well circumscribed. But it's tough because you're right; it goes to both edges into the bottom, so we really don't know how big this is. It'd be like a piece of a of a giant tumor, mm -hmm. but it seems to be like they got most of it out with their specimen. So probably that's going to favor benign. Mm -hmm. But we may have to use other features. We may have to use other criteria to, to really define whether it's benign or malignant. So that one we can't use 100%. Yes. So what other what what else made you think it might be malign versus malignant? Um so the cells themselves when we um zoom in uh are are very similar. Um there's not a lot of um atypia Good. And uh, do you think this is an epithelial or non-epithelial lesion? Non-epithelial. I was well, thinking, well. When you say epithelial, mm -hmm. remember that that's like a, a family of different things. So a lot of people, they think of epithelial, they think of squamous epithelium. But right. Remember, right. you've got, you know, apocrine glands or epithelium, mm -hmm. apocrine glands or epithelium, sebaceous glands, you know, there's an epithelium. So, so it doesn't always have to be stratified squamous epithelium. So yes. I, I, I'm into my statement. <laughs> um, yes, because I thought that these looked like apocrine uh, gland cells. Good. So it's epithelial, glandular, apocrine glands. Mm -hmm. And just like we saw with that hydronite stuff your TV a couple of slides mm -hmm. ago, um, you can see the apocrine differentiation here. Yes. Kind of like uh, that, like um, decapitation. Good. Decapitation secretion. Good. Mm -hmm. okay. 
and there's no pleomorphism of the cells. Mm -hmm. um, there's no atypia, there's no mitotic figure. So it's a benign process. So it's a benign. So what do you talk about? We call something a benign glandular epithelial neoplasm in the skin. What's the general name for that that we use? Um, like an, like a glandular, <laughs> like a, you said, but like a benign glandular cells. You well, mean? or just like an adenoma. Oh, okay. Okay. Versus mm -hmm. an adenocarcinoma. I see. I see what you're so going to Adeno about. means gland. Mm -hmm. So it's just an adenoma. So we know it's in, it's going to be a, an apocrine adenoma, yeah. if you will, of mm -hmm. sorts. And is there any subtype of apocrine adenoma that this would look like here that's kind of a, a cystic lesion like well it probably felt like a little dermal nodule mm -hmm. uh, we don't know what part of the body it came from it, it could be maybe from the genital area for example okay that helps because I, I kind of had a few things on my differential um I had uh I was actually favoring mostly the nipple adenoma um but I had also um the hydradenoma proliferum which would be in the genital area and yeah then, well can you tell a nipple adenoma from a hydradenoma papillary from just histologically not really because uh yeah i was also like trying to look for um like clues as to where it was on the body um and because we don't have the epidermis uh, or any surrounding structures it was really hard yeah no and you're right basically you can't tell them apart they, they really are kind of the same entity in a way um they both are related to apocrine glands and their apocrine glands in the nipple just like their apocrine glands in the genitalia um and in the vulvar area which is the most common site where these lesions arise um and they can look very very similar so if you they probably would not ask you on a board examination to distinguish between those two so th that's if you if, the, if those are the two things in your differential then you're doing really well here um, one other clue that we sometimes see with hydradenoma papillary from that we don't see as commonly with nipple adenoma, but that's not a criterion for diagnosis, are plasma cells, often in these little clusters present between the glands. There's not really very many of those here, so that's not really seen in this example, but that is something that you'll often see when you uh, are looking at, at a hydradenoma papillary from, and, uh, it, but it, you don't have to see it. So... Um, what about if they put in syringocyst adenoma papilliferum? Would that yeah. be something that, you would think about? Yeah, that was also on my differential, but that was the one that I was reading had more of the plasma cell infiltrates. You um, needed both both of them. Okay. But that one's usually going to be associated with more of a verrucous epithelial hyperplasia, and you'll often see some epidermis or stratified yeah. squamous epithelium. That usually doesn't present as a cyst or a nodule. It's, it's like a, a, a verrucous warty lesion often seen in association with nevus sebaceous. So that would be, but it's in the same family. So they're probably, uh, they might want you to distinguish between those two because this usually looks more like a cyst as opposed to the other one. That, that's really a subtle distinction and I doubt that they would, would really ask you that. So this would probably be one that would be maybe just a slide recognition. Uh, they'd give you like, uh, you know, a list of 10 diagnoses and expect you to sort of pick this out of, of that. So it's pretty straightforward. And uh, these rarely become malignant. If they do, you're going to see a benign area and you'll see maybe one little zone where you start seeking some pleomorphism and mitotic figures and atypicality. Uh, rarely we see one of these that's diffusely atypical. Usually these have been present for many years and then they go slow, slow malignant degeneration if they're going to do that. But they're all 99% of the time, they're just benign lesions. Very good. Thank you. Okay, we got one last one. Kind of a cute one. Hi, Dr. Cockerell. I'll take this one. This is Caroline. Um, so here I thought we had either like an excision or a punch biopsy. Um, looking at the first section, you can appreciate some scale crust and an ulcer there. Um, yeah. There's a little bit of epidermal hyperplasia and then a broad strip of cartilage. Um, so what then, part of the body are we on? Most likely the ear, but could be the nose. Okay, good. The cartilage. Um, now, um, could it possibly be the finger? Hmm, would you, I guess if, yeah, if you went deep enough, maybe you would see bone, but. 
Well, this this is that's kind of a, that's kind of yeah. a basic histology question, but uh, this is more hyaline cartilage, like we see in the ear, the nose, that kind of thing. Whereas if you're seeing fibrocartilage, that's kind of the cartilage that you see, like in the joint space area. So you see more of a you'd see bone beneath it and whatnot. So probably not the finger. So you're right. This is most likely the ear or the nose. And if you had to choose one of those two, which which do you like a little bit better? I was thinking the ear. Yeah, yeah. We ear doesn't have a lot of sebaceous lobules. We've got a couple here, but you biopsy somebody's nose, and if you took a big deep biopsy of someone's nose like this, you're going to see a, a ton of sebaceous lobules. So yeah, I, I agree with you. This is most likely the ear, and so this is. Would you say on a scale of one to ten, this is an easy one or a hard one? Well, I'm really between two uh, main things on the differential. So, and I have my reasons for both. Um, but I was thinking either CNH or relapsing polychondritis. Okay, good, good, or, good. I'm glad you put that in there because that's probably what the board examination is going to do. Because um, what else might they throw in there to try to fool you? Uh, you can get like weathering nodules of the ear, but I know that would be a lot more bland than this. You know, uh, that's that's an interesting thing. That probably is a variant of CNH. Um, it's not as much pressure induced as much as more wind and sun and all that kind of stuff, but it's basically kind of the same analogous condition and maybe a little bit of pressure. So, but I, I don't know they would throw that in there. That's too close to this. But they might put in like a cartilaginous tumor, you know, they might say osteochondroma or, you know, mixed tumor, you know, something like that where they might try to throw you off of the cartilage. But the main one they would probably want you to distinguish is between uh, chondrodermatitis and uh, they might put in there also um, a pseudocyst of the oracle. So let's see if we can distinguish between these three in the last few minutes here. So why is it not relapsing polychondritis from this view right here. Yeah, I felt like I would see more of the inflammation in the perichondral tissue. Yeah, it um, needs to be in here. It's actually an autoimmune disease that's attacking the cartilage. And it doesn't just attack the ear cartilage, it gets the nose cartilage, it gets the cartilage of the, you know, the valves of the heart, it gets cartilage of the trachea. It's a bad disease. And so they, you see lymphocytes in here, and then you get it gets replaced by fibrosis over the course of time. So you can rule that out from this. And you never see this, okay? This is the pressure trauma from, you know, probably maybe hearing aid or somebody talking on the phone too much or sleeping on that side of the ear. And then you get this fibrosis and whatnot here overlying the cartilage up here. It's notice that it's confined to that area. So this is, is due to trauma outside in inflammation. This is not due to autoimmunity. And notice that it's mostly neutrophils here as opposed to lymphocytes. Now, mm -hmm. why is it not pseudocyst of the oracle? So I didn't really see like a cyst. Um... And that's not a real cyst, right? Oh, right. Um... It, it, pseudocyst is actually pretty yeah, good. not a real cyst. What's what's the pathophysiology of that condition? I need to review that one. Um, well, just go to the just turn on WWE wrestling one night or something, in, or boxing, and look at those guys' ears, and they all have pseudocysts of the oracle. They all basically, uh, you know, they get that cauliflower ear because they get repeated trauma, not just like hearing aid trauma. They get they get boxed in the ear. You know, they get these uh, these holes they get put on, they, they crunch their ear, they do that over and over again, they get slammed out of the canvas, and their cartilage gets gets blunt trauma, and then they get inflammation, they get degeneration of the cartilage centrally, and it kind of turns into this oily material, and, and it doesn't really, it's not a true cyst, but they do actually get that oily degeneration of the cartilage centrally with inflammation sort of inside out as opposed to outside in. And then it gets replaced by fibrosis and eventually it kind of goes away and they just have mostly scar where the cartilage used to be. If you damage and destroy cartilage, it doesn't grow back, unfortunately. And so um, maybe we're getting stem cells that we can inject in here and cause cartilage to regrow, but 
if you damage your cartilage like this, it's gone. And then you just lose the substance of your ear or your nose or whatever. And so um, that's pseudocyst of the auricle. This is chondrodermatitis. Another name for that is ear corn, which is actually not a bad name because it's sort of analogous to like a, a clavus or something like that due to pressure, but it's overlying the cartilage and then you get the inflammation and then you get the fibrosis surrounding it. So you're exactly right. This is C and H. But, but the other two, you need to make sure you know the differential because that's what they're going to ask you. Probably would really want to focus on making sure you didn't confuse this with uh, relapsing polychondritis. Mm -hmm. Okay, those are, those are all fairly easy sort of typical ones that could very easily appear on the exam. They're not esoteric. They're not bizarre. And, you know, maybe out of this group, the only one that you, you might be unlikely to to contact uh, to to possibly encounter be a mucosal, but they might show that too. All right, any questions or any comments or things? All right, well, thank you guys very much for attending, and uh, we'll get you another set of cases for next month. Thank you. Thank you. So long. Have a great holiday. Bye.